in the first 50 years since our independence, the Supreme Court has created a very sound jurisprudence, which we continue to reap from. It is the inertia, really, that has kept us going till now. But the way things stand today, court processes are a trial, even before the trial has begun. While I cannot say if it is a collective failure on our part, but for a nation governed by the rule of law, is it not a matter of concern that to this extent, at least, we are defying the idea of inclusiveness? Not a reform, but a revolution is what it needs to be able to meet the challenges on the ground and keep this institution serviceable for a common man and keep it relevant for the nation. I cannot recall the last time the judicial wing of the state made so much news. On a lighter note, the American founding father, Hamilton, who had suggested that the judiciary was the least dangerous branch of the three branches. And I'll refer to him again during the course of my address. But were he to be here today, I wonder if he would have felt the same way. More so, in the light of the Indian Express top 100 most powerful Indians, which included several names from the judiciary. But the fact of the matter is that if we have to take stock, or st uh, take stock of how we have fared, and about seven decades later, since we have ventured into becoming a constitutional order, this appears to be an opportune time to do so. We might as well do it comprehensively. And by comprehensively, what I mean is that we must evaluate both the bedrock principles and the form principles because the vision of justice, the way I understand, is a compound of both. Clearly, they are not unconnected. A few months back, I had the occasion to deliver the Justice P. D. Desai Memorial Lecture at Ahmedabad. And there I had proposed that attaining constitutional idealism, which Mr. Jha had mentioned, was not like chasing a rainbow. And the Supreme Court, through its pronouncements, had been reflecting it. It would not be a display of any pessimism of the intellect. If today I were to say that while indeed attaining constitutional idealism is not like chasing a rainbow, but it is so only in the courtrooms, perhaps because the fields are where rainbows are. The point being that the way the nation is built and the way this grand vision of justice is attained in the confines of courts through judicial pronouncements and the way they are built on the ground are two very disparate realities. On 19th of June of this year, the Indian Express had published a very insightful article. This was selected from the Economist, titled as How Democracy Dies. It said at one place, independent judges and noisy journalists are democracy's first line of defense. <laughs> Reports of the death of democracy are greatly exaggerated. I'm quoting from Indian Express. But the least bad system of government ever devised is in trouble. It needs Defenders, I agree. But I have a suggestion, a slight modification in today's context. Not only independent judges and noisy journalists, but even independent journalists and sometimes noisy judges.
for me, this is what Ramnath Ji stood for. The freedom to say that two plus two makes four. And that is how I remember him. Someone who could call a spade a spade. Someone who could speak truth to power. Even if it came at a cost, to be ready to break but not to bend could be called obstinacy by some and determination by others. I cannot say for others, but as far as I am concerned, I only feel that we need to ask ourselves some questions. Where is the Goenka in us? His ideals? His values? Is that extraordinary phenomena losing his relevance today after all these years? Why I have chosen the topic for this discourse merits a context too. And this is the context. These are some very sore questions, but too significant to get lost in the everydayness. And when it is so, what other better tribute can there be to a visionary who embodied in so many ways the spirit of a constitution than to spend a thought? To spend a thought over how far we have come to achieve the vision that he had seen as someone who had helped to free the country in one era and help it to become a meaningful democracy in another. The Supreme Court's 2015 ruling in Shreya Singhal. It is a celebrated judgment where the Supreme Court held the public's right to know was directly affected by Section 66A of the Information Technology Act. Interestingly, while doing so, the court was certainly inspired by, amongst others, rulings, Ramesh Thapar, Bridge Bhushan, Bennett Coleman. If you would recall, these were perhaps some of the earliest pronouncements protecting an independent Indian speech and expression and were delivered in the light of the rights of the press, which verdict themselves had endorsed that a democracy was a marketplace of ideas where the people had a right to know that prior restraints were anathematic to a democracy and that the foundation of speech and the press is the arc of the covenant of democracy. Sriya Singhal took this legacy ahead as it improved upon the jurisprudence on the independence of the press to attain and promote the constitutional precept of plurality of thought, diversity of opinion, and the ethos of dem democracy in the technical age and in the co context of online speech. The vision of justice was indeed attained in the courtroom, not once, but multiple times. I ask myself, has it translated into reality? Has the success of these strong verdicts reached the ground? I will let the facts speak for themselves. On the ground, it appears to be a descent into chaos. And it is worrisome on all counts. When you sue the messenger, or you shoot the messenger, or when the messenger himself declined to deliver the message because of the fear psychosis. There is an India that believes that it is the new order. And there is an India that lives behind a ridiculously drawn poverty line. On daily wages, in night shelters, with no access to education or health care, let alone access to courts. One India in the above-mentioned perspective is the vision and to know how far we have succeeded in attaining this vision of justice is really a matter of perception. Nevertheless, there is a graphic disparity right there 
and removing this disparity will be the mission for the Indian judiciary in times to come. And I may add that for that to happen, it is going to require a constitutional moment of its own kind in the life of this institution, which I believe has been long overdue. But in the light of what a French author had once said, I quote, everything has been said already, but as no one listens, we must begin again. I will only ask and request those at the helm to finally listen so that we must not have to begin again. In addition to that, I also feel that there is a pressing need to explore the endless limits of legal services mechanism. Legal awareness and legal empowerment of the marginalized in this vastly unequal society of ours have to be made an observable reality. This institution, the judiciary, is the last bastion of hope and the one that the citizens we believe firmly will give justice to them, come what may. And it has. The judiciary, with whatever little it has at its hand, has been a proud guardian of the great constitutional vision. It fills me with immense pride to see that an institution, as an institution, the judiciary has been endowed with the greatest societal trust. This fact gives it credibility and this very credibility gives it legitimacy. It is a very enviable spot for an institution. I'll only say that if, that if it wishes to preserve its moral and institutional leverage, the judiciary must remain uncontaminated and independent and fierce and at all times. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So is an institution. And if introspection is where we have to begin, we might as well begin there. Perhaps we can hope and endeavor that in the future, it is not our finality, but our infallibility that should define us. It is my imagination of an ideal world, and I am aware of what Carl Jung has said of it. He said, I quote, every form of addiction is bad, no matter whether narcotic be alcohol, morphine, or idealism. I don't know how true these views are on alcohol and morphine. But as far as idealism is concerned, I would say it should be pursued like an axiom. 